Okay. Welcome, church. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this uh, beautiful, peaceful Sunday. Um, want to welcome each one of you and just say hello. And uh, you are welcome here at Brentwood Lighthouse Baptist Church. If you're joining us uh, virtually today, uh, we're very blessed to have you. We welcome you online. We are very joyful to have you with us. And we welcome everyone in Christ's love. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for sending the Lord Jesus Christ, for accomplishing what you accomplished through your Son on that cross. Today, Lord, in peace and solace and calm, we just absorb what you have done. We ask you to manifest the results of what you have done on that cross in our lives, in our bodies, in our personal transformation, God, in our minds and hearts. We ask you to illuminate that for our families, Father, and bless them and encourage them and all the saints, Lord, today that would be greatly encouraged and blessed. Those that are taking communion, Lord, we just thank you so much that you invite us to draw near. May our attitude be filled with gratitude and thanksgiving, God, inviting that healing and blessing directly into our lives. Be with us today, God. It is a wonderful Sunday today. And we give you all honor, all praise, all power, and all glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, church. Okay. The Gospel of Grace calls. Today we'll be in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. So I prayed after um, Resurrection Sunday. And uh, God, I started reading and, and asking God to, to give us something special, something very blessed after such a wonderful time as, uh, as Resurrection Sunday and I think he's done that. And so we'll have a mini series here coming up over the next couple of months, uh, maybe a month. Let's get, uh, let's get started. Um, it's been a great time the past two weeks celebrating Palm Sunday and Resurrection Sunday together here at the Lighthouse. Uh, it's my prayer that the magnificent power, the resurrection power of God... That is the same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work, blessing and transforming each one of you in your daily lives. The result of all the tremendous works that Christ accomplished on that cross are the greatest gifts to mankind. The gospel of grace has been fully delivered by God and Christ on that cross. And it is calling out to any and all who will listen and obey. The gospel of grace calls. Let's start today by reading 2 Timothy 1, 7 through 10. Two Timothy chapter one, starting in verse seven through verse ten. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but a power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity. 
but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Amen. Boy, did he ever. Amen. There's a powerful four verses here. And we're going to take a look today mainly at, at one of them. We're going to start looking at verse 7. There's so much in this. Some interesting things I read as I was researching this. You know that the, the Bible says he brought life and immortality to light. And it is said that before Christ came to the cross, God hadn't revealed to Old Testament saints and people in the Old Testament really a lot about immortality. He hadn't revealed yet what the gospel was going to bring to us and give us in the way of abolishing death and bringing life and immortality to light because he brought it through the gospel, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last Sunday, we celebrated... It is one of the greatest moments, even knowing that these things were not purposely not revealed to the pre-Christian people in the world by God, even to bring it to light through the death, burial, and resurrection. Immortality became known. It became known to you. Eternal life and God's plan to abolish death. They simply didn't understand it. And God didn't make it clear. So the gospel of grace has called us to clarity, vision, understanding, and so much more. Amen? The gospel of grace calls us to a spirit of power, love, and discipline. It's where we're going to focus ourselves today. Let's read verse 7. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. This is what God gives us as His people when we commune, when we accept, when we receive Christ, and when we know He is our Savior. The gospel of grace has called us to all of these things. Yes, you must make your commitment. You see, today the Bible said, join me in suffering in the gospel. I want to tell you, whatever suffering that I had to do to align myself with a death like Jesus's, I'm glad that I was able to do it. And whatever suffering comes in the future... I'm glad and thankful and I have an attitude of gratitude for whatever it is because I know what I have. Life and light has been brought forth to my immortality and my existence forever with Jesus Christ. Amen? I know what I have. And you can know as well. And God wants you to know this. The gospel does not call us to a spirit of timidity. Let's start with what it's not. See, the gospel, the Bible says the gospel was brought to light at the death, burial, and resurrection. God brought it forth to the world. And everybody's like, what? Immortality, eternal life, abolishing death. Death no longer has any hold on someone who believes in Jesus. These were revelations to people. And it should be a revelation to you and I as well. Death has no hold on the believers in Jesus Christ. The gospel does not call us to a spirit of timidity. A spirit of timidity, the Greek word, which can also be translated fear, we're going to speak a little profound today. So I'm, I'm not in a mood to cut it short or to sugarcoat things. I want you to know the power that God is delivering to you by what happened in the magnitude of that sacrifice on the cross. 
The Greek word, which can also be translated fear, denotes a cowardly, shameful fear caused by a weak, selfish character. That is not what the gospel calls you to. I'll be the first to say when I look back years ago when I came to the Lord, that would have described me very well. Although you might have saw me and thought that I was proud, thought that I was tough, thought that I was bold and living in a way that would uh, promote me over other individuals. That was a false perception. Deep inside, this would have described more of who I was. A cowardly, shameful, fearful person. Ashamed of the gospel and thinking that I was going to, in my own power, change the world, produce the life that I desired, have a victorious family, and conquer every problem. I thought I can do that myself. And the Bible describes that as a fearful, cowardly attitude because I was afraid to let God in. And I'm telling you to testify today, boy, is that a mistake that I ever made? And am I ever grateful that I was able to overcome my cowardice and choose Christ? Caused by a weak, selfish character. The threat of, get this church, we're going to go back to what Timothy's experiencing now and relate this to ourselves. The threat of Roman persecution, which was escalating under Nero, the hostility of those in the Ephesian church who resented Timothy's leadership, and the assaults of false teachers with their sophisticated systems of deceptions. All these may have been very overwhelming to Timothy. Maybe things are overwhelming you. I was very overwhelmed. People started asking me years ago, he's in church again on Sunday. What are you doing there? They expected me to be out ruling the world with them. Doing things that were ungodly and, and not presentable before the Lord. And people said to me, what are you doing in church again? You're not supposed to be there. You're embarrassing us. Thank God cowardice did not rob me of Jesus Christ at that time. Do not let anything in the world, false powers, deceptive teachings, persecution, just like Timothy, Roman persecution, uh, resentful people in your group, in your crowd, who don't want you to be leading in Christ, and assaults from deceptive teachers may have been overwhelming Timothy. But see, a spirit of timidity is not what God has given you. It is what it is not. The gospel does not call you to a spirit of fear and timidity to cower down when the world tries to hold you back from standing boldly for Jesus Christ. If this was happening to Timothy, if fear was overwhelming him, the one thing we all need to know is it was not from God. The fear in Timothy, the fear in me, I was afraid. And I had reason to fear. You may be afraid. It's a new life. It's newness. It's walking in Christ. It's people telling you, he was in church again on Sunday. Who does he think he is? You don't belong there. You're not fit for that. Lies. All lies. And I especially charge my brothers in Christ, you stand up. And you take hold of what God has given you. The real power is here. Amen? This is the real resurrection power. Nothing can remove the stone in your life. Nothing can bring about the desires of your heart. The things that you truly desire, just you and God, they have nothing to do with anybody else. You and Him and the good things that you desire for yourself, nothing will roll away the stone of obstruction in your life 
except the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Fear is not from God. Let's talk about what the gospel calls us to. What does it call us to? The Bible says the gospel of grace calls us to and infuses believers with divine power. And we're going to talk about that right now. The Bible says, I have given you a spirit of power, love, and discipline. First off, power. I need power. I choose Christ. There are inhibitions. I may be a little fearful. It's a new life. I need power from God. God has positively already given believers all the spiritual resources they need for every trial and threat. You need to know that now. If you're wondering, God has already given you as a believer, as a new believer, as someone standing up for Christ, boldly making your own decision, not looking left or right or caring for what anybody else says. If you're that person, God has given you power for every trial and every threat. And he's given it to you in abundance that you may face, in abundance that you may face in the future. He's got your back already planned out. Amen? Let's take a look at a few verses that talk about what God has given us. Matthew 10, 19, and 20. Matthew chapter 10, verse 19. But when they hand you over, do not worry about how or what you are to say, for it will be given you in that hour what you are to say. For it is not you who speak, but it is the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Divine power. See, we're going to talk real. I don't feel like sugarcoating. Not after Resurrection Sunday. God has given me power to speak. Divine power, effective, productive, spiritual energy belongs to the believers of Jesus Christ. It's yours. It's yours. The enemy doesn't want you to have it. He doesn't want you to see it. He wants to take you back to doubt, fear, and put you back where you were, which is unproductive, negative, and going to cause your life to suffer greatly. Effective, productive, divine power belongs to every believer of Jesus Christ. Let's look at Ephesians 1, 18 through 21. 1, 18 through 21. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? That's you. Verse 19, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might, which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Christ has been given authority in this age and all ages and in the age to come. And when you choose to stand by him, this is the power that he's readily giving you. The enemy, Satan, the devil, is out to take that away from you. To have you join him in misery and eternal failure. And I tell you that the power is yours to seize. It is yours to take hold of. And Christ has given it abundantly. I always say this. I've said it many times. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He does not take a man or woman and twist your arm. He doesn't grab you by the arm and pull it behind your back and rub your face in this word and said, you grab this power and you grab it now and you take hold of it and you stand up for me in this world. He is a gentleman. He tells you what's available. He calls you in love. 
He respects you no matter what. If it takes you six months or a year to grab hold of this, or six years or 60 years, He is always a gentleman to you. The choice is ours. The matter is at hand. You get to make your decision when God and His Word are penetrating your heart and mind and you're going to take this stand. Let's take a look at Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. We're talking about the power that God has given you just by saying yes to Jesus and standing up and communing with Him. Even today, if you communed with Him, you have stood up boldly and accepted Him in your heart. That power is yours. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to Him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Again, the Holy Spirit is not pushing me into this. He said, this power is divine. It's there and it's working for you. It is magnificent and it can do far more abundantly for me and for you than you could ever think or imagine. Showing you right now that he could never take me and push me so hard in this word that I could ever even think or imagine what he could possibly do. He tells me, you could never think. No matter how much I push you or how much I grind you in this, you'll never be able to think or imagine the magnitude of the power that I'm giving to you. So he is a gentleman. And he lovingly, calmly nudges me toward the word and encouraging me to give me light, to enlighten me that I can understand what's actually at my fingertips, what's been given me. We have a church to rebuild. We have a beautiful, wonderful, loving church that has provided for us everything we need to plan a future for it. And we have the power to do it. Amen. And we're going to take hold of it. And we're going to build this church. You are invited and welcome to come here, to join here, to be a part of it. And we know that we have the power for everything that might come our way, every test, everything that might attack us, every obstacle, every problem. God has already given us everything. And we're going to stay faithful in the word and preach the truth of God. We're not going to compromise. We're not going to sell out. We're going to stay faithful to the true word of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Nothing makes me happier than that. Let's read Zechariah 4, 2 through 7. Speaking of the power. Zechariah 4, 2 through 7. God has packed this message so you'll know the power that you have. Starting in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 2. He said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand all of gold with its bowl on top of it and its seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. Also two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me saying, what are these my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel, you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. Come on, church. 
Listen to how this lays out. The seven lamps with a bowl. The seven lamps picture abundant oil supply. It's the power of God. The two olive trees next to the bowl powering the lamps. You are the lamps. The two olive trees next to the bowl that is supplying your power. They picture limitless supply. The oil is of olives. Olive oil represents the Holy Spirit and power in the Bible. Do not let your lamp run out of oil. You all know, many of you know the parables. If your lamp runs out, you're pretty much done for. Here this represents to Zerubbabel power. The bowl is Holy Spirit power. The trees represent unlimited reproduction of olives. Continually empowering and filling the bowl. Limitless power. This was for Zerubbabel to finish the work in rebuilding the temple. You see, you are the temple of God. I've been working on this temple for 30 plus years in Christ. It has brought forth some fruit. And I'm very thankful for that. God wants to bring forth fruit in your life for you to rebuild your temple. The limited supply of Holy Spirit power is unlimited. There's no limit to the supply of power you have to rebuild your temple. The Bible says, are you not the temple of God? He's living in you. You are the temple. No human might, no human wealth, no human physical stamina would be sufficient to complete the work. Only the power of the Holy Spirit and the representation of the olive trees and the bowl empowering Israel to rebuild the city, the nation of Israel with unlimited supply. This is your body, your temple being rebuilt with the world trying to knock you down, trying to smash your dreams, take away everything that you hope for. You have unlimited power. This must be duly noted. It is only the power of the Holy Spirit to rebuild your temple. This fact is incredible. It must be duly noted that the church today, that is you, those who commune, if you commune and accept Jesus, if you love him in your heart, if you know that he's your savior, you are the church it is duly noted that the church has presently, temporarily taken this role in the age of grace until Israel's salvation and restoration. The church has temporarily taken this role that Zerubbabel saw in today's age of grace, after the resurrection of Christ, the new covenant, that unlimited supply, that bowl of power, supplied limitless, has been given to you, the church. You have taken over the temporary role in the present day, taken this role in the age of grace until Israel's salvation and restoration, at which time, as Israel's restoration, that same power that you've been temporarily given will give you your glorified bodies as you reign with Christ. The power of God will give you your glorified body as Israel takes back over control of the limitless power of God to restore their nation and to rebuild themselves in accordance with Christ. That happens after the seven years of tribulation, when Christ sets up the millennial reign on earth, this is going to happen. Christ will return. He will reunite Israel and their restoration and salvation is coming. Until then, you have been given temporary possession of this power. Amen?
That is a staggering fact. Yes, thank you, church. Something I didn't even realize in full, how truly blessed we are. The call of the gospel of grace infuses believers with love. Back to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, chapter 7. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. Let's talk about the remaining two now that you know you have unlimited supply of power. Love. The gospel of grace is calling believers to a spirit of love. Very simply, this kind of love centers on pleasing God and seeking the welfare of others even before one's own welfare. Welfare. I'm going to say it again because this was just so simple. This kind of love that's given to believers centers on pleasing God and seeking the welfare of others before one's own. Romans 14, 7 through 8. Romans 14, 7. For not one of us lives for himself and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. You've heard me say before, I'm not really worried about when I die. And there's the power of God and the love that I have to live to please Him and to help others as if they were myself is evident. If I die or if I live, I'm, I belong to the Lord. And I find my contentment and the power of these scriptures. Galatians 5, 22 through 25. You all, most of you all know this one. Galatians 5, starting in 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. No law. When I walk by the Spirit, when I walk in this power, when I obtain the love that pleases God, and I let the Holy Spirit work through me, the Holy Spirit's power is love and all the following are a derivative of love. Peace, patience, kindness, goodness are all aspects of love. Love being the key offering of the fruit of the Spirit of the living God. Love. Love that pleases Him. I want to read 1 John 4, 17 through 19. 1 John 4, 17 through 19. Starting in 17, by this love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. A powerful. Don't fear. Don't be fearful and be willing to admit your fears and your lack of power. You can draw on God and continue to rebuild. You have to stand firm. The power is available. We do not come to God in love, yet hide from Him in terror. Love is perfected and fear is casted out. Fear involves torment or punishment. This reality is one that sons and daughters of God will never experience because they are completely forgiven. Knowing this, we are commanded to love. John 13, 34, and 35. John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. 
By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. We are called to love. Lastly, The gospel of grace calls believers and infuses them with the spirit of discipline. This one I love, and it was the hardest one for me to interpret and to really make a reality in my life. Power, all you can ever use. Love simply pleases God and begins to love others as yourself. But you're also infused with a spirit of discipline. This discipline refers to a self-controlled and properly prioritized mind. This is really where the battle is. Remember the, the, the book that was written, The Battlefield of the Mind, and it was supposed to help you overcome and rebuild your life and gain hold of your senses and conquer and become victorious? There is a truth to the spirit of discipline referring to a self-controlled and properly prioritized mind. This is the opposite of fear and cowardice that causes disorder and confusion. Focusing on the sovereign nature and perfect purposes of our eternal God allows believers to control their lives with godly wisdom and competence in every situation. This is the key. Discipline was the hardest for me. I say, I, I tell people, after 30 plus years of learning discipline, try to take Jesus from me. I will not give him up. I have nothing without him. He is my whole life the discipline of my life, all that I live for, everything that I am, everything that I want to be, everything that I've ever been is linked to Him and Him alone. And I choose nothing else but Him. And that is a fact. And I'd say, don't mess with it. Because I've been disciplined over the years to know this is something that men and women must grasp hold of. If you're lacking if you're finding uh, inability to achieve what, you, what your life desires in this power and in this love, you must find discipline. You have to master it. God allows believers to control their lives with godly wisdom and confidence in every situation. What you've just been told here today and read in the Bible is godly wisdom and confidence and power. That you believe that you have everything that God has spoken to you today. Every problem's already been headed off by God. Every threat, every issue, every dramatic event that you're going to have, and if you're like me, over-dramatize sometimes and make it the end of the world, God has already been there, checked it, and given me everything I need to overcome it. Amen. Hallelujah. Don't get caught up in your own drama. Let God, give God room. Let the power work in you. Romans 12, 3, as we wind this down. Romans 12, 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought, think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Sound judgment for the disciplined Christian is that Christ is everything in my life. I don't need anything else. See, my mind is sound. I'm disciplined. It's Christ and Christ alone. Nothing else. Everything Him and letting everything else unfold around that. He does the separating. He separates the wheat from the chaff. He takes care of the things in my life. Sound judgment in exercising this. Sound judgment. It leads to believers that they would recognize in themselves that they are nothing. And it will yield the very useful fruit of humility. 
I had a family once. I failed at it. I had a business, totally bombed. Thought I was going to build a life, totally ruined it. Had two kids, totally ruined my ability to be a father over them and have the life that I dreamed of, totally and completely ruined all of it. And that was the fruit of my work, big and tough, and failed at everything. You see, understanding discipline and godliness and sound judgment lets me know that I've already shown what I can do, nothing. Thank you, amen. It's humility. That humility comes in me, and then I say, give God some room to work. I'm not even going into what God has achieved today, not even, I don't even need to do that. I'm standing here and there's a big difference between letting myself guide and letting him guide and learning to master power, love and discipline and self-control and exercising this sound judgment, realizing that we are yielding the very useful fruit of humility. Titus 3.2. Titus 3.2 says... To malign no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. If you only knew how much that I live to pray for you and to see you obtain what God has for you in life, the desires of your heart. I just explained what most men are desiring and how I totally ruined every bit of it in my own life. I've been there, I know. I don't have to, you don't have to tell me twice. I already know. Titus 1.8 But hospitable, loving what is good, sensible, just, devout, devout, self-controlled. Very sensible. Knowing everything, every good gift comes from Jesus Christ. So now you see why I say don't take that. You're not taking it because I would be back to what I had before. And men, I encourage you, stand up, take hold. Don't let anyone tell you different. Rob you of what God is just handing to you, giving it to you through discipline, love, and power. In closing, 1 Peter says, in 1 Peter 5, 6 and 8. 6 through 8. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Humility is what I just described. I don't know what point you're at in life. I don't know how much your testimony may line up with mine. I know that it does in so many ways even if we can't see between the blurred lines. Life without God is crushing. There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. No matter how you look at life, it will end in disaster apart from Jesus Christ. To humble oneself before God is to take all the focus off yourself. And to focus only on what can save you. Only on what really matters. That is your eternal salvation at the cross of Jesus Christ. To simply confess your sins. Ask forgiveness of them. And to leave them forever at the foot of the cross. And we always say... Stay in a church, keep in the Word, so that you gain wisdom on understanding what I've just said. I still sin, but I've left it at the foot of the cross. When you give it to God, you have to continue to pursue. 
I have pursued for over 30 years and it has paid multiple dividends in my life. It covers what we tell you and say, get in a church, stay in the Bible when you simply give your life to God. 32 years of manifesting this power and learning to discipline myself. Don't give up. Don't think that, don't go out a couple of months after accepting God and thinking, oh, it must not be for me. It's just a lie. See, we're going to go back to power, what, it, what a spirit of timidity is not. And you don't want to go there. You remember what I said a spirit of timidity represents in the Greek? Right? It's me being a coward. Me making excuses and saying, I guess it wasn't for me. It's a spirit of timidity. It's not for you. You don't have that. It's not from God. If this is you today, simply pray. If you're watching virtually out there, pray. We pray that this word can impact you in a way like never before. And you can pray with me now to begin this cycle. Begin a new life. Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you and we praise you. Today, I personally come before you, God, and I acknowledge my sin openly before you. I believe in the power of Jesus Christ and his blood to forgive my sin. And I ask you, God, please forgive me. Forgive my sin. Open up my heart. And come and live inside of me. I invite you. I encourage you. And I ask you, Father. Lord Jesus, be my Savior. And be Lord of my life. And I'm thankful for such a precious gift. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 If you prayed this, you've already...